The exciting claims and grand promises of genetic technology are ready made for headlines and for sound bites. Yet in the rush to achieve banner stories, it's easy to push aside the serious questions and concerns that this technology raises. Good minds can debate which parts of de-extinction are worth pursuing, but I think we can all agree that there are obvious pitfalls ahead that merit close attention. Let's start by talking about the poster child for de-extinction, the passenger pigeon. The first European visitors to North America noted huge flocks of the pigeons which darkened the skies from horizon to horizon as they flew past at around 60 miles an hour. Even in the 19th century, when the pigeons were starting to decline, different observers estimated over a billion birds in some of the flocks. A market hunter with a shotgun could close his eyes and point the shotgun up in the air, pull the trigger, and with a single shot bring down 50 or 100 birds. When the pigeons roosted in a beech or chestnut forest, the combined weight of the birds would cause the collapse of giant tree limbs with a sound like cannon fire. Yet the last passenger pigeon on Earth named Martha died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. What happened to them all? The easy answer is that it was probably a combination of loss of their forests to agriculture and market hunting. But here's the question that I think we should ask before we try to bring them back. In the late 1800s, there were still thousands of pigeons left, some in flocks and protected areas. Why didn't any of those populations rebound? The likely answer is that the birds, which laid only one egg each, needed hundreds of thousands of other pigeons around them to stimulate proper mating and nesting and to overwhelm their predators. This is a well-known phenomenon. Biologists call it the Ali effect. The more there are of you, the better you do. So the de-extinction experts are going to try to revive what may be the most social bird in North American history. And at great cost, we'll bring back five or six of them, or 50. Here's a related problem, which applies to passenger pigeons and many of the proposed de-extinction candidates, such as the woolly mammoth, the thylacine, and the Carolina parakeet. Who's going to mother the baby passenger pigeon? This has already been talked about a bit. A band-tailed pigeon, evidently. We know that this species behaves very differently than passenger pigeons did. They fly differently. They mate differently. They eat different foods. They have different calls. Maternal care, which we learn more every year, is critically important for an infant's normal development, even if it's only for a few weeks. That baby passenger pigeon will live in a cage labeled passenger pigeon. But it may not be like a real passenger pigeon, and I don't think it's going to bring passenger pigeons back from extinction. I think the best expectation we have here is that whatever pigeon emerges from the experiment will have some lost traits that are really worthy of study. Now, the next problem is a genetic problem. In the first college course I took in molecular biology, which fortunately for me was taught by Francis Crick, we learned that DNA is a book of instructions, which tells how to make a specific organism. DNA makes RNA makes protein. That was the mantra. And the DNA code is the same for just about all organisms. Wow, what a feeling of excitement that idea generated at that time and still generates. But here we are a half century later, and we now know that things are not so simple. A gene, a DNA strand, doesn't tell you how to read it and make an organism. It's more like a database, a dictionary, than a book of instructions. All the words in Hamlet are in my dictionary, but if I scan the pages of my dictionary, Hamlet does not fall out of them. The emerging science of epigenetics, the most exciting development in molecular biology, in recent years, tells us that a strand of DNA can be read in hundreds, maybe thousands of ways. It's the proteins and non-coding RNAs in that first egg cell which tell it what parts of the DNA to read, in what order to read the parts in, and what parts of the DNA to skip altogether, at least at that phase of development. So it's the internal and external environments of the egg cell that tell the cell how to use the DNA to make an organism. 
That's why genetically identical clones of plants or identical twins of animals, which have the same DNA, can be quite different if they're grown in different environments. They can be very different. With de-extinction, the epigenetic departures from the expected are likely to be more extreme than in cloned plants or identical twins. Because, for example, epigenetic factors in the egg cell of a band-tailed pigeon that contains inserted passenger pigeon DNA will be different from the epigenetic factors components of the cells of an original passenger pigeon mother, which it's very unlikely we can recover. How the passenger pigeon's DNA will be read by the Bantel pigeon's egg cell is anybody's guess. I described this problem to a molecular biologist friend of mine, Jerry Langer, and he had a very clever suggestion for the de-extinction scientists, and perhaps they thought of it already. Take two clearly different but closely related living species, living species. Pretend one of them is extinct and put its DNA into an egg cell of the other species using the new technologies. When you get a viable organism, you can see how well it matches the original DNA donor. There'll be plenty of living examples to compare it to. My suggestion would be to use a black rat as the faux extinct DNA donor and its genetic cousin, the commoner brown rat, as the surrogate mother. Although plenty of other common living species, would, species pairs would work, the Eurasian tree sparrow and the house sparrow, for example. If the animal you get from the black rat DNA out of the brown rat mother behaves and looks just like a black rat, great, then you're home free. If not, you may want to do some rethinking. In the long run, I think the best contribution de-extinction technology may have to offer conservation will be to reintroduce valuable genetic variation into small, still existing populations that have lost those genes. This remains to be seen. I think it could be a great contribution. It's already been mentioned here. Finally, there's a problem which has been mentioned many times, not just here, so I'll only briefly discuss it. If it works, de-extinction will only target a very few species, and it's extremely expensive. Will it divert conservation dollars from tried and true conservation measures that already work, in which are already short of funds? They're always short of funds. Strategies such as protected areas, genetic management of small remnant populations, which is expensive, and public campaigns to reduce consumption of endangered species. These are some examples of existing conservation techniques that work. At this very moment, brave conservationists are risking their lives to protect dwindling groups of existing African forest elephants from heavily armed poachers. And here we are in this safe auditorium talking about bringing back the woolly mammoth. Think about it. The conservation movement has based much of its appeal on the power of the idea that extinction is forever. Do we undercut conservation if the public including certain members of Congress who I won't name, is led to believe that extinction is only temporary, a technological bump on the, in the road, nothing to worry about. Right now, de-extinction is just an interesting idea, what we might call recreational conservation at this stage of the game. I think we should follow it up carefully if we like, but we should ease off on the hype. Hype can come back to bite you. Thank you.